Well, it's a great pleasure being able to talk to you, especially here from Spain. Uh, <laughs> that uh, actually, with your new CD twenty four, uh, you released this single Fandango, which is kind yes. of like a fusion between flamenco and jazz. And and coming uh, being here from Spain, uh, I wanted to ask you how how is important flamenco in your music and your life in your playing style and everything. Well, I mean, I I. I tremendously love it you know but i'm i'm not a flamenco player but i you know i've i've certainly been uh you know non-intentionally uh influenced by it uh, because you know so many great players and uh, i was fortunate to to have that uh period of time with paco de lucia and uh you know we created some amazing uh interplay together you know in our in our time that we did that we spent touring and also recording so yeah it's been indirectly uh, uh an influence you know but i but i've never like studied uh how how to do it because i play with a pick primarily um but uh just tremendous respect and appreciation for it you know and if the influences are in my music it's 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 um uh, it's not where I'm thinking of flamenco, but there might be some, uh, you know, unintentional uh, inspirations, you know. Actually, you mentioned the pig. I was going to ask you later on, but because you mentioned it, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, it's not it's not very typical to hear like guitarists playing like classical or nylon string guitar with pig. So what right. is your approach to that? And why, why, I mean, did you ever try to play with fingers or just, I don't know? No, well, I play with fingers. Uh, I play like a, um, a lot of the new music, especially on the, on the new record. Because uh, um, I, I write everything out with pencil. But uh, a lot of it's a hybrid of pick and fingers. So I'm picking the low notes and, and I'm, I'm also using my fingers for the high strings. It's a hybrid. Okay. And uh, now that you say <laughs> you write with pencil, uh, in, in this album, there's a lot of nice like orchestrals and string arrangements and everything. And I, 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 I would like to ask you a little bit of, of the, your process of, of composing songs. Also, if you write the arrangements and if you use, you know, any software or just everything by hand. Like, yeah, I, I, it's, I, I did all the arrangements. I, I wrote everything out. It, it was a, uh, I would say, uh, started in the beginning of 2020 when the COVID happened, uh, and it started as a, uh, just as a, with the intention of it being a solo nylon acoustic record, solo, no overdub, nothing. Uh, so, uh, because the time was uh, so long, you know, I had uh, so much time on my hands that I, I got the urge to start to put more instruments and percussion and, uh, and it just grew. Uh, and it turned into uh, a very lengthy record in terms of it, the time and also the production. Uh, so now it's a double record. Uh, um, and it's much more production than I originally uh, envisioned. So probably a four year project, which is why I call it, the record company really is calling it 24 as as in 2024, you know, it finished. And did you, how did you record it? Did you record with live musicians uh, or by tracks or overdubs? What was the recording process? Uh, there a lot, there's a lot of overdubs because it was very, uh, there was a lot of alone time uh, with that first year in particular. Uh, and then uh, there was some live, very, not so much live, uh, but there was some live with the tabla player that uh, I made Kavlakar, who was on uh, a couple of tracks that was live uh, together. Uh, but mostly uh, it's a very personal record where I'm doing all, I'm doing most of the other percussion, uh, bass and uh, keyboards and things of that nature. Uh, I think in, in, we could say that in your whole career, percussion has been very, very important for you in your recordings and like uh, some styles from, I don't know, maybe India or some other countries. 
Uh, could you tell us about, uh, about what you feel with, with percussion and all this time? I don't know. I, I, you know, I think my my first love was for uh, drums, and and then in my teen years, even though I was playing guitar, studying guitar, I was I was just very much taken by uh, Latin music, and I used to hang out by myself as a young teenager in uh, in Latin clubs in New York City, and um, I used to practice. Latin rhythm or or rhythms on my desktop during my school years, and you know keep the time the quarter note time with my foot and practice a lot of syncopations, uh, and I, I used to do a lot of that and I still do, and apply it to my guitar playing. So I'm I'm always syncopating rhythm, even if I'm reading classical music, not all classical music. Because with Bach it doesn't work, but with Piazzolla as as a, as an example, it works beautifully to to read his music and then syncopate at the same time I'm reading it. Uh, and then most of the music that I write on my own is uh, is very very percussion syncopated, you know, oriented. Actually, you play you play a lot of uh, musical different styles, and you also played a lot of acoustic, electric, and, and both nylon. And I wanted to ask you a little bit of, of how do you approach the three different guitars? Because I mean, it's kind of very different the electric guitar from the nylon guitar. Also, acoustic has its own things. So, do you have different approaches to any of the three guitars, or how do you feel about the, the three walls? <laughs> Well, the approach is it says the the certain uh, limitations uh, that if if you do play a, a nylon in particular, um, you don't have the the, the lyrical uh, ability or the it's the vocal like ability that you would with the sustain of an electric guitar. So, um, which is why you you hear sometimes on the new record you you might hear. Um, the electric guitar come in and playing the longer melodic phrases, um, which is really like you could you could view it as sort of like a vocalist. And um, uh, uh oh, did I lose you? I didn't lose you, did I? No, right? Oh, you got frozen. <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh. Are you there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there was another call coming in. I'm using my wife's computer, so her mother was calling. <laughs> <laughs> so, but with the uh, the nylon guitar, uh, you know, I could play more rhythm, uh, you know, that I might not normally play on the electric guitar. So, yeah, you, you just think differently, uh, and you know that each instrument has its, uh, you know, qualities that are different from one another. Uh, for so, uh, but I'll tell you what, I mean, to, to play, there are a lot of electric players that just cannot play an nylon guitar. <laughs> it's just, it's very hard. It's, it's more work uh, for the hands to play a nylon guitar. And, and I think that the response time on a nylon is not as fast. So you have to, work a little bit harder uh to to execute you know especially fast phrases and, and, and about one thing that i was wondering is about the technique <clears throat> because you're a highly skilled and your, your technique is unbelievable we all know that uh this would be like to question the one uh if, if you still practice a lot and what 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 is your your practice routine that you do and also is it, yeah if, my part if you practice practice more, on one or the other guitar? I, I practice, yeah, I practice, uh, wow. You know, I just started uh, playing electric again, uh, and we're on an electric tour. I'm in the middle of it, sort of. Um, but most of my practice is on the acoustic guitar because it's it's still the most challenging. When I go to electric, I, I find it's, uh, it's, it's easier, but it's a, diff it's a different animal, you know, altogether. Uh, but 
I do have to practice the electric guitar because some of the music is very electric oriented, you know. So we're this electric tour that we we started uh, is really aimed at uh, focusing on the very very early music. It's kind of like uh, you know me going back to the very early music was something I did I didn't think of uh, until after the heart attack. You know, and I, I, I thought it would be good to, you know, since I have a second chance in life to uh, to revisit the more popular part of my career, you know, and it really shows in the audience reaction, especially in the United States. Uh, they really love electric music here. Oh, my God. It's the difference is night and day. And in Europe, I don't know. Uh, because I, I, didn't, I haven't done so much electric in, in Europe, but I think they mostly know me for acoustic. But uh, I'm maintaining both both my electric group and different musicians for my acoustic uh, in Europe. I'm maintaining both. So, uh, in fact, I have some tours that are acoustic and some are electric. And, I, and I'll probably maintain uh, these two personas uh, going forward. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you recovered great. I didn't want to get that personal in the interview, but I'm glad that you're doing great and you're doing shows. That's great news. Uh, yeah, I feel great. So now you look great, so that's perfect. And, and, and <laughs> you know, I, I don't know in what, what, what you were mentioning about Europe, but, but for me, that I'm a musician too, and uh, I have known from you, from you all, all my life. Yeah, we we probably have an image of you like more of an acoustic player than an electric here. So, but but you play electric great and your sound is beautiful too. So and and now that they see that you have the Beatles uh, picture there, uh, I read that one of your main inspirations to play guitar was the Beatles. Well, as I was growing up, the Beatles were very popular, and and the music had incredible aesthetic. I mean. I mean, if you really look at pieces like Yesterday or Michelle or a lot of their here, there, and everywhere, there's, you know, there's, they're beautiful songs, you know? I mean, and, and you, if you look at the music um, and you study it and you learn it, you, you realize that, that it's, it's not silly music. It's not frivolous kind of pop music, that throwaway. It's really it's it's almost classical in the, in the sense that it it will live forever, you know. It's really good. It's aesthetically beautiful, you know. Uh, yeah, they're short. They're short little pieces. So when I did my own adaptation of the Beatles, I I I imagined uh, I reimagined the Beatles pieces uh, and kept what I loved about those pieces in but they couldn't be two minutes long, you know? So I, I imagine if they were instrumentals instead of vocal pieces, you know, where it could go, how you would expand on it and then return to the main theme again, of course. So, you know, reimagining the Beatles on two, those two different records I did was uh, one of the most uh, uh, fulfilling and, and and rewarding things, especially the when we did when I did the first one or Abbey Road, it was one of the highlights of my whole career to to be in the same environment and same studio, and it was pretty, it was really cool to make that happen. Uh, I'm really glad that happened, and I, that was super. And and what made it interesting was uh, <coughs> was keeping it all acoustic without uh without overdub uh or with minimal so very very min minimalistic uh and not invite musicians to come in because it would have been uh you i i may have been drawn to uh you know making it too complex and i wanted to do a, a something very different than most people uh have done you know because a lot of people try try to do the Beatles exactly like the Beatles and then that's, that's not cool yeah, yeah. well and, and they were they were also like uh, very very important in, 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 in 
talking in terms of production also, like with George Martin, and, and they, they just changed the whole world of production. The production was so great. I mean, I, I, I had the, uh, the, I was very honored to, to be given uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award by George Martin. He gave me on, on my birthday in, uh, at the BBC in London. I was like out of a dream, like, you know, did that really happen? You know, but it really happened. And I got a chance to talk to him about, about the Beatles and about uh, many issues of hearing and all the problems that he has. And, and I also have with, with ringing of the ears. But um, when he, when he heard from me that, that, you know, the Beatles were uh, very important and, and an influence for me, uh, he was shocked. He, he says, "Really, really, the Be you you really like the Beatles?" I said, "George, he says, well, they they were good, but you know, they they weren't uh, you know of the same level of you know Rogers and Hart and the Broadway, you know, or the old." And I said, "What? What?" I said, "What? No, 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 no. They were more important." <laughs> I was arguing with him about, you know, something that he thought was, yeah, it was good. I mean, they were good. The lads were good, but, you know, one, no, they weren't phenomenal. No, they were phenomenal, you know. Yeah. Well, now, now you remind me of Quincy Jones talking about Michael Jackson saying that he was not like a great child or, you know, but um, Michael was also great. So, you know. <laughs> super, super great. Super great. And, and Definitely. <laughs> Do you think that, uh, because we are talking about production, you think that today everything is too much overproduced? And I, I remember something Steve Lukather said that, that, that there's some people that right now can they can't even play a, a three-minute song, but they produce it and it's sort of like, wow, that's amazing. Do you think it's everything too overproduced now? Uh... It's only if, I don't know, because I don't really, I, I mean, I don't like what is super popular today. It's not for me. I mean, the the best, uh, the most unbelievable period of music was the 60s and the 70s for me. Uh, I mean, look what came out of London in the 60s. It's, it's just unbelievable how many great, pop and rock groups uh, and also jazz, not out of London, but you know, what was happening in the sixties was the most explosive period of, of rock music and pop music. And then into the seventies, it expanded and, and then this whole new genre and, uh, and pioneering uh, days of uh, fusion music and jazz rock produced you know, three of the greatest groups, Return to Forever and Weather Report and Mahavishnu, and and all, all the spinoffs of that. Uh, today, I, I I don't know what I don't I don't know if there's anything that that blows me away. I know there's a lot of great guitar players uh, that you see every minute on on TV, or not on TV, but on on the computer or on my phone, and I'm going, wow, this guy's wow amazing but not a lot of them or not even any of them have any music it's what is impressive is what they're playing but what what's the, where's the song Where, where's are they going to be remembered for their song or, or, or their album i don't think so i mean they they have to they have to get to a point where where they're they're not only known for this, you know. When I think of Paco, I also think of you know Paco. Uh, it's not just his playing, but also some of the the songs and the albums. And it was the same with us in in our field of jazz, rock, or fusion. We were also known for the compositions and the records. And Steve Lukather will be the first to say say that when you think of steve you think of a great player but but you're thinking of the great songs so a lot of these young guitar players are not there yet at all zero 
I mean, you're only thinking of them just because of what they're playing, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I have had the chance to interview great, like Steve and many other guitarists, and they all, many of them talk to me about this, what you're saying of the songs. But but I probably think that, that even if they wanted to do songs, they cannot make it because, like, uh, if you look Instagram, all the media, no one wants to do songs like so even if these guys would like to do a seven minute songs i think no one would, would listen so it's a very difficult problem well the other the other problem is there are no record companies that will support them uh and 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 help help build their career like we had because the record industry is is uh pretty much i would say dead you know, close, close to dead. You know, it's, it's, it's not the same. Isn't it? You know, we used to have record stores on every corner, everywhere. You'd walk into the store and there's your record and, you know, it's, it's, it was the, it was a great time, you know? So these young players will never get to experience their records in a store only online. And it's not the same. And, uh, you know, and of course, the record companies are not going to put money into building a career uh, and support a tour. So it's a uh, it's a difficult time. I mean, you could discover them because of the internet, but I don't know how far you can go with that. Yeah. And when you plan to do like records like this, like this one, do do you track uh, track what what your audience likes more a little more or and, and try to make music thinking what they're gonna like or you just do whatever you feel you want to do and you know. no, no i do i do whatever i whatever i feel and uh i wasn't thinking at all especially especially with this record i went to a deeper place a deeper place where uh, I wasn't thinking at all of radio or uh, or sales. Uh, of course, it's yeah. You know, I wanted to be liked, but I wanted to like it uh, first, like always. Always, I I have to like it first. But I I went to um, places like on on the pieces like that are called immeasurable immeasurable one two and three are are very intricate but i i i like them you know it's not where i intentionally said i'm going to make these very intricate but they're interesting to me and there's not a lot of pieces like that that i've done like those before so I think I've evolved as a composer uh, and a player, but I think as more as a composer, I'd rather be, I'd rather be known as a composer than, you know, I want to be composer guitarist, not gu guitarist composer, because I'm at the stage in my life where the composition is very much more important. Well, I must I must tell you that when I listened to the CD, I really loved it. And and I one thing I was thinking is that I I will I will expect there was more like crazy solos running around, and and I really love the album. It's beautiful. The music is, and it's not like a guitarist album. I mean, it's for me it's more like an orchestral thing, something different. So, so you, you made it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it was a, it was a big evolution step you know, uh, for me, this record. Uh, and I think uh, part of the reason or most of the reason was we had a, a year of COVID and no traveling and total focus and also a, a therapeutic approach. Uh, it was It was therapy for me to write because I was so... Uh, so glued to the news channel, the television, and and all of the horrible news of people dying, and it was my only escape was to go into downstairs into my studio and write. Because when I'm writing, I mean, just actually playing and then writing, the process of writing 
or reading music, one or the other, completely takes me away from uh, pain and and worry. You 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 can't think of the things that are happening while you're writing, while reading music. Yeah, you need a lot of so, yeah. I mean, I if if I'm not writing the music or reading the music, just playing, you could still drift your your mind to the to the news, and it could it could you know what I mean. But writing and reading is very involved. It involves your mind completely, only to that. So it was a therapeutic uh, thing that as well as creative, you know. Yeah, actually, uh, you mentioned Paco, the great Paco. Paco said in an interview that he used to practice a lot watching TV. He would put like, uh, I think, soccer games or football, and he just start practicing. <laughs> always, I would always practice watching TV. But in this case, because the TV was overwhelming on, on an issue that the world has never seen, I had to get away from the TV. But but whenever whenever, <laughs> but I always encourage people uh, if that wasn't happening to uh, never watch TV without the guitar. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, I recommend it because, a lot to my students because they can be like one hour focused watching TV, so it's one hour they practice. <laughs> absolutely, and so, and and the thing about it is, if you're watching the TV and you're listening to what's happening in the story and you're playing, you may play something that you might normally never play. And sometimes you have to go, oh, whoa, that, that was weird. Wait a minute. And then you might even like it and you might even write it down or you might start something that you might not normally do if the TV wasn't on. You see what I mean? Yeah, and also, and also what well, I do, I do it a lot. And, and you, you, you improvise in... If you watch a movie, you are changing of key signature all the time, so it's great for your ear too. So you're just you know changing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I love it. Uh, you you are doing now this this electric years tour, uh, but I, I I was thinking, are are you gonna after you finish the electric tour, are you gonna take uh, the twenty four the new album uh, on tour? No, I mean I'm yeah. My acoustic, uh, yes, my acoustic group in in Europe. And uh, in fact, uh, I leave in a week and a half for for Germany. Uh, I don't know where I'm going. I got to look at my, I got to look at this thing. Um, let's see. I have Germany coming up, uh, Poland. I'm going to, <laughs> my third show is in, Bucharest, where I had the heart attack. Oh. So I'm going back to Bucharest, and I'm going to bring the the surgeon, the doctor who oh. saved my life, on the mm -hmm. stage. And uh, then I have Milan for two days, and then I have uh, Holland. Okay, so I have a a, a short acoustic run in Europe. Uh, coming right up in a, in a week and a half and then I come back to the States and I'll, I'll start again with the electric completely different format but the acoustic is, is mostly uh, uh, not most half half uh, from the new record yeah yeah. how difficult is uh, to learn the repertoire from a, from a record like this and how do you prepare the record I mean do you need a lot of time to practice do you need do you yeah. teach it or um, sheet music or just remember everything memorized? Some I some I remember and some uh there I I read, you know, and so the same with the other guy, you know, my other guitarist from uh, uh he's from Italy, uh, Paolo Alfonsi. Uh but the electric is uh all memorized, you know. It's it's quite are quite a bit more simple than than what what you hear on twenty four <laughs> twenty four some hard shit man yeah well that's why I was asking because why I want wouldn't want to imagine how he's learning all that and and talking about the electric when I was reading you know preparing the interview uh, I was thinking uh, music 
we always say that music is like the universal language that you know can communicate everyone uh, from many countries and there's so many good stories and i think that's like a so beautiful story that relates to you about your tour and it has to do with the uh, violinist even gar the violinist uh oh would you tell us the story you oh evan gar yeah evan gar yeah oh yeah he's he's uh he's uh a self-taught, uh, wonderful, great violinist. I think his big inspiration was Jean Luc Ponty, and uh, I played uh, several years ago. I, I guess it was 2014, maybe. I don't know. 2015. I don't know. But uh, I played the Toronto Jazz Festival, and my percussionist said, uh, "You you have to hear this this guy that came to the show." Uh, he brought his violin, and uh, he, he plays your music. Al, you got to hear him. So I said, well, have him come backstage. So he came back after the show, and, and I was blown away. I, I I couldn't believe how good he was. So I I asked him, I said, uh, where are you from? He says, well, I'm from Detroit. I drove all the way from Detroit I, to Toronto. I said, holy miracle, just to see the show and meet me. So I said, well, where, where are you going now? He goes, well, I'm driving back to Detroit. I said, no. And I stood up and I put my hand in my pocket and I didn't even look at how much I had in my hand. I could, I, I, I think it was like a few hundred, I don't know what it was. But I, I just, I said, open your hand. And I put, I put all the money that I pulled out of my pocket. I didn't even look at it. I said, just, he says, Take this money. You're going to Montreal tomorrow, and you're going to play with us. Just meet us in Montreal. You're playing with us tomorrow night. So I told the audience the story, and they, the audience gave a standing ovation. And it was very emotional. The kid the guy was crying, you know. Uh, and so I had him play, uh, of course, more than that. Uh, and then I invited him on that next tour that year, you know? So, I mean, he's from, he's from like, you know, a very rough, you know, black neighborhood in uh, Detroit, really. Like, like how did he play that kind of music coming from that environment uh, is very, uh, very perplexing and very interesting. Uh, yeah, I think I think I thought that was uh, such a beautiful story that I wanted you to share it for for the yeah yeah it was a, it was a, it's a great story, you know. And, and that reminds uh, me of, of the beginning of Pat Metheny when when Gary Barton discovered Pat Metheny. I don't know if you know that story. No. Yeah, Gary Barton was playing in, in Pat Metheny's town when he was sixteen or seventeen, like, and he showed with a guitar to the show and. He said, I know all your tunes. And Gary Barton said, okay, we're going to invite this little kid to play. And when they saw him play, was like... Uh, that's how, that's how it works. <laughs> that's, how it, that's how it can work. Uh, you know, in my case, uh, which I tell... I now, now I tell the story every night that I went to Berkeley School of Music. And... Uh, <laughs> While I was there, my favorite group was Return to Forever, with Chick Corea, Stanley Clark. And right. So I saw the band two or three times. And the last time I saw them, uh, they had a different guitar player. They had Earl Klug. You know who he is? Yeah, I know. Yeah, he plays a lot of acoustic. Too. Only. But he was standing there with a Les Paul and a Marshall amp and I and I said that's very odd because that's not Earl Klug you know so I called a friend of mine back in New Jersey this friend of mine is like my older brother he was maybe seven seven years older than me and he was really my sister's friend but he was imagine like he was like a Woodstock hippie always high always smoking marijuana always high from drugs but the nicest guy in the world, just the nicest guy. And he was also a, an amateur recording engineer. 
really very amateur. He had a reel to reel TAC four channel. And he wanted to record me when I was 17 years old, uh, when I when I had a gig uh, with the Barry Miles Quartet on New Year's Eve. So he recorded the show, but first, first before I went on, he says, I want you to take this tab of acid. I said, <laughs> what? I said, what is that? He goes, oh, trust me. You you will love it. I said, What? I don't know anything about this. You know, I'm 17, you know, I don't I don't even smoke. I never smoked before. You know. So he goes, take it. It's New Year's Eve. Trust me. So I was tripping. So great. It was amazing. And I heard the tape after, and I was playing lines that I never knew before that were phenomenal. It was, I haven't played that good since that night. Still. So he, because I called him from Boston and I said, I saw Return to Forever Clue. I only said to him on the phone, Michael, I would, oh man, I would love to play with that band someday. Man, if I ever got the opportunity, boy, that would be amazing. That's all I said. I didn't say anything more. But he took the tape and he found Chick and the management in New York City. He found them and he bugged them and bothered them and he wouldn't stop. He said, I'm not leaving till you hear this tape. And then he'd go into the city maybe 10 times and they'd always like turn him away. But they listened. Finally, they listened and Chick called me and he said, we heard your tape that your friend Michael made of you. He said, I said, oh, my God, what tape was that? He got something on New Year's Eve. I said, oh, my God. I said, like a dream come true. He goes, we want you to join the band, he said. And we need you to come to New York now for three days rehearsal. And, and then we're playing Carnegie Hall on Tuesday. Sold out. That was my first show. So I went home to my parents in New Jersey and my mother said, what are you doing off from school? I said, mom, I'm playing with Chick Corea. She goes, who's Chick Corea? And I said, mom, it's my favorite group, Return to Forever. And my father's in the background, what? Yeah, what are you doing off from school? I said, dad, I'm playing Carnegie Hall on Tuesday night. He says, get out of here. You're not playing Carnegie Hall. But that's a... So three days go by, I rehearsed with the band. It might have been two days, I don't remember. It wasn't much. Well, luckily I could read music very well because it was long charts. And uh, they sent a car to pick me up to go to Carnegie Hall. And my pa I took my parents and my father's sitting there looking at me. He goes, are you sure we're going to Carnegie Hall? I said, yeah, we're going to Carnegie Hall. He goes, I can't believe this, but you know, I always did tell you how you get to Carnegie Hall. And I said, yeah, I know, I know. Practice, practice, practice. Because yes, that's how you get to Carnegie Hall. I said to myself, I didn't, I didn't say it to him. That's not how you get to Carnegie Hall in my case. In my case, it was acid, acid, acid. This is what I got now, but this was the best way to finish the interview that was a great story man i just really appreciate so i i tell the audience this story every night because 